Welcome to the Canny Conversations podcast, conversations with a cause with social entrepreneur Safraz Ali. This week, Safras continues his conversation with cyber security expert Chris Woods from CyberQ about how to make and keep your business cyber secure. So let's join their conversation. Hello and welcome to another Canny Conversation with a Cause. A conversation that we hope will captivate your curiosity cannily. And um, Safraz Ali is with me uh, again today. Saf, how are you doing? I'm doing well, good. I'm doing good. You, you look very well. and, and, and you Not as well as you, with your red T-shirt that you've got on. Uh, yeah, you're, well, you're dressing down today, aren't you? You, you always look well. Um, we've got a guest today. And we've got somebody who, who, who's who been on before. And my goodness me, didn't he add some value? Brilliant. Nuggets of gold. A lot of wisdom there, a lot of experience. So we're going to change it a bit. You introduce him, Saf. Yes, it's Chris, the uh, the founder of Cyber, Cyber Q Group, Birmingham-based, but they're international in terms of their operation, US, uh, in the Southeast Asia as well. Uh, a gentleman who's got a lot of experience in terms of working in this particular area, worked a lot of, uh, worked in the Middle East, uh, has worked on an international platform, and now I'm glad that he's back here in Birmingham, helping the economy of Birmingham to thrive, and uh, you know protecting businesses and uh, and and getting the message uh, out uh, there. Hang on a minute, so oh. you're doing me out of a job. Oh, okay. <laughs> you're doing the introductions like <laughs> yeah. that. He was, a, he was a guest at our quantum dinner as well, so we spent a lot of quality time. Yeah, so, you're not supposed yeah. to do it well, Saf. Yeah. You're not supposed to do it so well. Please, not 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 as good as okay. Saf. Saf, you've got businesses which have got employees, hundreds of them. You um, have got customers, thousands of them, in in domiciliary care and the students that um, you serve as part of the, the the training group. So you hold a lot of personal data. Do you wake up at three o'clock in the morning in a cold sweat, thinking what would happen if somebody stole that data? At periods, there, there's been concerns, definitely. You know, we we have uh, we have a risk register that we look at. You know, it's 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 on our board meetings. It's something that we discuss on a regular basis. Uh, we get reports uh, on this data security is a, a big um, item for us in terms of a, in terms of a management group a leadership group uh, I've had to go on uh, a number of courses myself just to educate myself sit with professionals individuals and it's not a topic that I would have been thinking about probably even five years ago to be frank with you but it's more and more so and I think uh, you know we've uh, we've embedded uh, part as part of our onboarding and induction some you know we used to have data protection uh, in terms of a uh, it has a general general uh, uh, sort of onboarding course but now we've added this cyber cyber uh, related uh, courses as part of our onboarding and made people a little bit more aware so it is something that is close to my heart in terms of uh, a risk to our business and and any risks need to be looked at minimized and and uh, and and uh, considered on a regular basis Okay, Chris, how worried should Saf and other companies that hold a lot of data be? Well, hopefully Saf's paying someone to worry for him as, as, as the CEO and the, and the founder of the business. I think all businesses um, need to understand the risk. And I think going back to the risk register, how you quantify that. I think going back to what Seth um, said previously, you can't walk into any boardroom now and say cybersecurity important to your business. Everyone's going to nod their head. No one's going to turn around and say, no, it's not. But how that manifests itself, what mitigating risks and controls that they put in place, that's the secondary question. And I think ultimately all businesses should understand the risks and they should mitigate the risks. Um, so that that would be my kind of statement, especially around businesses and cybersecurity. I mean, do you, Saf, I mean, in terms of, Data protection. Let's talk about data protection for a moment. Um, how concerned are you and other businesses about the potential for breaches of data protection? Because let's talk about the two sorts of... Well, there are a number of, of sorts of damage that, that, that a 
this that could be caused. Obviously, there's reputational damage, which can be huge. Uh, British Airways, I think, were, were involved in an incident um, in the past and a number of other big companies as well. Um, there's the potential for um, quite big fines, I think, from the, the regulator, and perhaps Chris can tell us what those are. Um, so, I mean, do you welcome, Saf, as a, as a businessman, the 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 the, reg, the tighter regulation in this area, I mean, or do you think it's it's another burden on business that perhaps makes life even more difficult than it might be? I think uh, I mean, firstly, we've got the we've got we've got uh, GDPR, which is which uh, you know for the last few years we've all been used to, and uh, uh, and 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 really that transition transition has taken place, and people have been more aware of 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 data and what that means, and it's it's predominantly about systems and processes uh, more than anything else, and and how you look at data and what you what you what you do with that. Often, it's used uh, in some cases by businesses as an excuse. In terms of you know not being able to do certain things, but it's having that understanding of what what does it mean, what the practical, pragmatic element of that is. So you know really understanding what that what that means on a on a day to day basis. In terms of regulation, a lot of it isn't necessarily government regulation as such. Obviously, there's you know there's the you know there's there's fines there in terms of percentage of turnover that you could potentially uh, uh, have to pay, but. You know, if you're in the space of you know um, being part of a supply chain, uh, you've got a supply chain yourself. Then it's about good practice. It's about best practice. It's about really your policies and procedures. What does that look like? And it's also having those standards and the quality marks and what your standards are yourself. So if you're dealing with you know if you're dealing with individuals' personal data, you know if, you know we've got on our on our email system that I can't send an email out where there's a national insurance number. So if I just type in even my own national insurance number and I send it to you, to yourself, it'd block it. You know, I wouldn't be able to do, I can't just do that without encryption. I wouldn't be able to send uh, my ID to you. Uh, so if you ask me for my ID, uh, I can't just scan it on my passport. I can't send that. So we, you know, we're living with that and we're, we've got blocks on our email systems in terms of what we can, what, what we can transact, what we can do. We've got encryption throughout uh, we've got, you know, a lot of it is in the cloud and obviously we're not, you know, we're no longer storing things on a portable device anymore. So we've got those safeguards, we've got technology companies that are ever more savvy and and, and it's part of their cell to make sure the fact that that data is there. Most people still use the same sort of, uh, whether it's Amazon Web Services or whatever, they use similar sort of cloud systems, but it's there, uh, it's there for you. So it's no longer... The, the sort of server system that used to be where you use, you know, physical servers, we've moved away, uh, a little bit away from that. But yes, we do handle a lot of data. You know, I'm a data, you know, we're a data controller. We've got to be aware of the the level of data we keep and, and the length of it, key, uh, the length of it and the relevance of it and really have policies that we sign off and look at review on a continuous basis. Uh, aside from the reputational issues, Chris, mm. Um, I mean, what powers do does the regulator have if if there's a breach? It, the, the fines are, uh, can be ginormous, can't they? They can indeed. Yeah, five percent of turnover. Um, so again, on GDPR, if if there's a breach, I think the purpose of GDPR though is to get businesses ready and aware. It's not actually to 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 the fine. I think that there's obviously a stick there, but there's also a lot of carrots for businesses to improve their cybersecurity maturity. So it's about business looking internally, looking at their processes, looking at procedures, looking at their risks, and then coming up with a plan. As you know, as we talked about previously, there is no hundred percent in security. But if you've done the right thing, if you have the right controls, if you're analysing the risks. That's the key metrics that, you know, these fines look for. And it's not about just fining people. It's not about here's big fines. It's it's literally just getting businesses ready and making sure businesses are interacting at a, a certain maturity level so they can protect not only the data for themselves, but also their customers' data and, and you know, other data they may hold. It's, I've heard it said, and, and, and in a minute, perhaps, Chris, you can comment on this, yeah. but I've heard it said that the biggest area of vulnerability within a business are, are their own employees, yeah. either in terms of doing things maliciously or in terms of just just not knowing what they should do and what the rules are. So how, how big a part of um, 
the training um, that you provide and the induction that you provide to your employees, how big a part of that is about cyber security and protecting data and that kind of thing? Uh, well, it's a, 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 particularly the fact that we're dealing with uh, people's personal data, it is, it is a big part of it. Uh, I mean, I was in the banking sector before and compliance, uh, you know, we used to do on go on board uh, a part of our induction. We used to do the the these sort of courses, but then it was continuous, uh, and it was, you know, as part of every briefing, and it was regular communications, you know, newsletters and so forth. And uh, uh, and then we also have, you know, and so we've got we've got the same systems ourselves in terms of it's it's part of our onboarding, it's part of our induction. You 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 not only. Uh, share the knowledge but you test the people as well so they've got to be signed off to say you know they're, they they have a, a, a certain amount of competence we also monitor that on, on an ongoing basis so their line managers are very clear in terms of you know you know how, you know what that person's level is in terms of accessing the information what they can share and it's not just about you know uh, emails and so forth but it's you know telephone calls coming in how do you validate the fact that the, you're talking to the right to the to that particular person or the right level of person and and so forth so it is part of the the day-to-day work of 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 uh, particularly the 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 staff that we deal with uh that you know they've got to be aware they've got to be uh, you know, they've got to be competent in terms of understanding the risks, and uh, and that that level of knowledge needs to be appropriate in terms of that risk that they they potentially are dealing with. Chris, um, I'd be interested now when, 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 when the companies that you work for and you work for companies uh, all over the world. Um, do you find that people come to you because they recognise the potential risk and they want? to prevent something happening to them? Or, or is it all too often a case of we've got stung, so we're gonna, we need some help to sort out this mess? And because we now recognise the, the danger, the, you know, we need some help to protect us in the future. Uh, what sort of circumstances, I know it's a generalisation, but do people normally come to you because they've been stung or because they realise they're going to need help to protect themselves? It's actually both. Uh, unfortunately so sometimes you, you, the clues in the name cyber q group we're a hundred percent cyber security company uh, that's all we do we, we're not an it company we're not a risk company we're a hundred percent cyber security so businesses come to us because they need cyber security advice guidance they need to understand their strategy they want a roadmap they've got a budget constraints so again we get involved in these type of conversations and unfortunately people just get hacked and you know, having spent 25 years in this business at billion dollar organizations and working with some very large organizations, it's a very stressful situation. And when you have a CEO who's been breached, their data's for sale on the dark web, emails have been sent out, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but, you know, tears are shed and what, what do I, you know, what do I tell my shareholders? What do I tell my investors? Why didn't we do this properly? Who was on watch around this? It's a stressful situation. And, any incident response involves a lot of money then in regards to rectifying it and also trying to control the message. If I could just elaborate on that, I think there's three things that people should understand in an incident uh, response or when they get breached. Everyone thinks about the cyber security company um, coming in and doing what they call the containment. And the containment exists from a technical perspective to control what's gone on. How did they get in? Are they still here? Have they, How much data have they removed? The common questions that one would ask. But actually, people forget more about the legal part and the marketing part. And that's really important as, as well as the cyber part because what are you going to tell your customers? What are you going to tell your supply chain? How do you control the email flows? Because it's a very stressful situation, especially at a senior level, because the CEO and the investors and board will get involved because it's a breach of reputation and data. It's about understanding that. And that's the three things that we recommend that should your organization suffer a breach, it's not just the containment that a cybersecurity company would do, but it's also the legal and marketing as well. And I suppose just, just to quickly end there, for the for the last three or four years, we've seen a little bit of a, a move where, you know, you may have IT companies tr- trying to do cybersecurity, but what we see now is is organisations like ourselves, which is good to see, good UK, British cybersecurity company, um, go out there and be partners for organisations. Because if we're honest, partners... 
an organization should stick to their core business. If technology isn't their core business, then they should really give it to someone it is. If security isn't their core business, they should give it to an organization that it is. And that's what we're seeing change, especially as the cybersecurity landscape uh, increases, especially with the attacks. And the other stat, my final stat I will give you, which I, I personally find absolutely fascinating, been in this industry for 25 years, we've seen more attacks in 2021 than we've ever seen previously. Yet we've had more products and we've had more money in the cybersecurity industry than ever before. So unlike the Volvo and the seat belts, mm. it's not the case we have a seat belts and we have less deaths. We actually have an increase in products. We have an increase in investment. Unfortunately, we've got an increase in attacks. And again, maybe for another conversation, there's a reason why we've got so many attacks and we've got the reason why our weight's expanding out and more individuals and more organisations are getting breached. I want to explore that with you, Saf, if I can. Um, in, in two areas. First of all, um, the Chris said something I thought I found very interesting. Mm. I find a lot of what Chris says is yeah, very, very interesting. interesting honestly. But he said about there being a, an increase in the number of attacks. Mm. Now, and, and, and perhaps Chris can tell us why he thinks that is, because I think it's important, but... It, over the last period of time, and we're, we're doing this recording in the early part of 2022, we've had more people working from home, um, perhaps not with the access that I had before to the IT departments. Mm -hmm. um, so two questions for you, Saf. First of all, um, have you been more concerned about the risk because you've had people, m more people not working in the office? And secondly, you obviously provide services um, to local authorities, to, to, to other agencies. And do you find that now as part of the, the tendering process, mm. there's a requirement to demonstrate um, decent levels of, of security? Yeah, absolutely. In terms of the tendering process, uh, there, there's probably a whole section on security and risk. Um, and there's a whole, there's a certain levels of, so for example, you know, some tenders, if we don't have, say, cyber essentials, as an example, we just can't pass that uh, basic level. Um, you know, we're now, as I said, working towards cyber essentials plus. Uh, it's still not necessarily anything, you know, uh, that special to shout out about, but it is something that you know we need to do, and something that we need to you know, we need to do in the in the in the procurement process. But for uh, for most of it, it's about our policies, our processes. What do we do to mitigate those risks? You know, we do a penetration test on a yearly basis ourselves. Uh, we you know we do, we we do that for some of our contracts. We uh, we we're working towards a certain standard that that uh, that's benchmarks uh, quality and a lot of it is about procedures led you know and systems and, and risk mitigation uh, so you know how you know, how would we recover if this happened how do how do we recover for if that happened and so forth so and 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 for ourselves we've got to go through those levels of scenarios as well and and be conscious of the fact that we're prepared and it, it is uh, it is something that we we regularly report on it is an agenda on our on our meetings uh, that that I, that I look at and anything that that's uh, significant i i tend to report as well to uh, to other uh, to to board members as well, so, so that's something that that comes as part of my uh, CEO report uh, in in in, term, in terms of that. Um, in terms of your first first question, in term you know, with regard to working people working from home and that that level of uh, digitalness and so forth, uh, what we found is that you know we have people at different levels of ability. You know, people generally moan about IT. IT is a frustration for people. And if it, if it doesn't work, really, they get upset. You know, if they can't log in or if it's slow or, you know, this isn't working. In some cases, it's quite simple. And, you know, people often joke, or joke about if you go to the IT department, they'll ask you to just restart and start again or whatever, or just to see if you're, if you're actually plugged in. But there's a lot more to it. So we've had to support people remotely with regard to that and, and and you start seeing the fact that you know from uh you know how somebody can take over your computer so i you know I, you know i was working from home and our our it uh person you know very very easily was actually controlling my my laptop 
uh, and you could see what exactly what it is and it just opens up your mind the fact that how these things happen and, and so forth and he was able to fix my uh, uh, Outlook device he was able to sort of clean up um, some of the uh, the download section that I had and, and just gave it give me a once over in terms of you know the, the, the laptop that I was working from and this is all from remote you know working from remote and that's that's you know what we're used to um, and it's not something that I had to, uh, experienced before. If I had an issue before, it was a case of here's here's my issue. Can you go and fix it? Now you're they're doing it while you're there, and you're you know and you're consciously seeing somebody sort of going in there and and moving the mouse and moving into different apps and so forth. And it's a bit of an eye opener. So you know it's it's it's, it's really uh, well on. fascinating stuff there, Chris. You said I think we'd we'd like. Perhaps our listeners would like to understand why you think there was the increase in 2021 with the number of attacks. Uh, and then I want you to talk, if you would, about what does the... We, we've talked about what a typical cyber criminal looks like in, a, in, an, in an earlier broadcast. What does a typical Chris Wood look like? Somebody who's at the other side of the coin, who's policing who's trying to find the, the the holes you know how do you get these people because Seth you're a big you're you're obviously a great champion of apprenticeships are there any apprenticeships in cyber security there yeah, there are it's very difficult to get the trainers though because they're on double the sort of average trader salary uh, because they can earn more money possibly being a technical expert so you know for us it's a it's a it's a field that we've looked at because the, the the demand is there, but it's a very specialist field. And as Chris said earlier on, you know, it's out of our comfort zone currently because we don't have the technical expertise. So even if we wanted to, unless we actually had a full plan of getting the right people on board, getting the planning right, it's some, not something that we would be able to do overnight. But there are some uh, some apprenticeship uh, training companies who've who are who've who've come out of who've been incubated by IT companies because partly it's it's talent managing their own their own staff, uh, but yeah yeah it's a we don't b- want to lose field. it, Chris. Yeah, uh, um, um, but I, I thought it was important to yeah. ask, ask that question <laughs> because one of the things that I wanted to get you to talk about now is how you recruit um you know how do you recruit people into this game are they are they ex hackers who have decided to. <laughs> To, to see the light but 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 first of all why more attacks in 2021 yeah, um i was gonna, we need to have a conversation about princess yeah. on, on, on the mind because uh, again just quickly on that the skill set especially in the united kingdom and the western world um is shrinking when the market's growing and we need to do something about that but I'll, I'll, I'll address that but going back to the increasing threats that we're seeing just in 2021 and just previously i think there's a couple of reasons uh the first reason i'll give you an example so um as I've said previously, I was a penetration tester. So 23, 24 years ago, I was employed by big companies to go and hack them. And we used to hack servers and we used to hack laptops. That's what we did. Um, about two years ago, without obviously revealing who the customer was, um, we did a physical attack into a building and we discovered that the, the gentleman there had an eye kettle. So an eye kettle um, is the ability to control it on your app. So you can set it to a certain temperature and it will send you a text message when it's ready or you can turn it on or by doing it from your app. Um, the reason this eye kettle was purchased was because this individual, this gentleman, wanted to brew green tea at 38 degrees because 38 degrees is the optimum temperature. Don't quote me on that, maybe 36. But anyway, it's around about that temperature and that's the reason the eye kettle was purchased. We figured out quite quickly that we could hack the eye kettle. And um, we did hack the eye kettle. So the eye kettle is inside an organisation. So that's great. We can turn the kettle up and down. We can do the temperature, and you know that's fantastic. But actually, gaining access to that eye kettle was on the same what they call local area network as the board meeting, and the board meeting also the boardroom had an Android TV, a camera, and microphones like any you know board meeting room you'd expect to have we were able to hack the TV and record a board meeting. Mm. And for me, that was fascinating because what we've just done there is we've found, and again, cybersecurity is no different to physical security. Mm. So if you imagine that was a building, we found the back door open. We're in the back door. We now need to get access to the living room. It's 
It's very easy when you're in the back room. Now, that is the same as that eye kettle. That eye kettle gave us the opportunity to get inside the organisation. Once we're inside the organisation, we then got access to the Android TV and recorded a board meeting of who they were going to, who they liked, who they didn't like, just board meeting. Now, this organisation spends a lot of money on cybersecurity. And it was quite interesting. So when I played the board meeting back, it was the CEO, because um, security is always the CEO. It's always the, it's always the, uh, the top guy within the ear yeah, within the business. He was like, how did you do that? And my argument to that was, your kettle's crap. Uh, and, and going back to that IoT internet of things and going back to operational technology, the landscape is increasing. And you think today how much technology is in your house. You know, you've got a Google, Amazon, I don't know, heating, smart meters, smart gas, whatever. Yeah. You imagine what that's going to be like in five years. You imagine what that's going to be like in 10 years. This isn't decreasing, it's increasing. Yeah. Everything's going to be smart, yeah. which then in turn to answer your question directly, you've got a different threat landscape because it's growing and it's yeah. growing year, not year on year, month on month on month on month. And you never put technology into your building without a good reason to do so. So the reason that eye kettle was brought into the building is because the gentleman wanted to brew his green tea at 38 degrees and he wanted to use it on his phone because that's what, that's what you do now. Same for smart heating, smart cookers, smart fridges. And one doesn't comprehend them into their risks. You know, is that a risk? And also, how do you control that? So again, I think with the landscape increasing, one has to be aware. Just the second point, and then I'll move on. When people are working from home, they have that lot of tech in their home. People have CCTVs, people have cameras and so forth, which then in turn can open up that debate in regards, well, is it secure? And you then get into this grey area, who actually is going to make sure that that employee's home is secure? Who's going to ensure that that CCTV they just bought from Amazon Marketplace for $5.99 um, is secure for my business? And this is what we, and again, we're working organisations around that. You know, how do you ensure that's secure? How do you ensure the employee's house isn't going to be hacked? You know, and again, I think that's another reason that we're seeing, you know, increase in attacks as well. And also laptop devices are used for various other things as well. So that answers that question, hopefully, and why we're seeing an increase. Flipping that on to the, why the Chris Woods, the apprentices, and just to finish on that, we have got a massive issue in the United Kingdom and the Western world around cybersecurity skills and the salaries they demand, as Saf alluded to, you know, it's a very lucrative sector and it will continue to be for the foreseeable future. And that is, is because, you know, the talent out there versus, you know, the need, you know, there's not enough talent to meet the need. And ultimately, it's in everyone's interest to make sure that we fill that skill gap, especially going into the you know the, the the coming years that we're going to face, so that's something I think as a UK government and also a business that we that we need to address. Saf is fiendishly clever, isn't he? And he's a bit scary, isn't he? Don't you think? But I tell you one thing, you know. I hope you don't mind me calling you technical, Chris. No, but but you you at least understand what Chris says. <laughs> there's you know there's some technical people that you know that I've had I have had conversations with. It just completely goes over your head. But at least where I'm sort of following, you know, and I'm intrigued in terms of the the information that I'm learning, and it's a continuous like learning journey. So, mm. part of my mind went into like a Bruce Willis film, Die Hard, when the the guy to, to, you know controls the sort of uh, the, the the whole uh, the, 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 the the airport and everything else and so I, I, forth. I, I, I was going to say stuff. He's he's, <laughs> he's he's fiendishly clever. He's scary. He explains it well. We could easily get come to dislike him, couldn't we? Um, <laughs> I'm the good guy. Now. Yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's, you, want, you want him on your side, <laughs> he, though, I think. He, he's not perfect. He's not perfect. He, he, he supports something called Aston Villa, so he's not, <laughs> okay. he's not a great football fan. Um, before, we, before we finish, and, and, and time cheats us every time, but there is something that I do want to explore, and I want Saf to talk about it first and then Chris to respond. Um, Cyber security is there to obviously protect businesses. But, you know, we've all heard workers say, look, it'd be easier to get into the Pentagon than it would be to get into my company's IT system. Uh, and sometimes I feel it in, in the, some of the work I do that almost the IT gets in the way of doing the job. Um, you know, it, it, it acts as a barrier to, to me being able to do our job properly. And, you know, with the work that you and your people do, Saf, 
uh, how do you get that balance between having a good level of security but not having it so intrusive and difficult that it kind of makes it difficult to do the job? Is that something that you've come across? I think there's people who uh, who uh, find sometimes things frustrating and, and IT is an area, and I'm generalising here, but IT is an area where uh, if it doesn't work quickly, uh, people get frustrated very easily because everything's on demand and they want it very quickly. So as an example, now, you know, with so even printing, you know, we, we don't allow our guys to be able to just print without putting a code in. And that code is specifically for them. Just introducing that a few years ago caused hey, havoc. People were saying, well, I'm, I only print this and so forth. And, you know, and, and you know, having clear desk policies and these basic things, just people have got used to to a, to a certain level, but you know, you know, in terms of any uh, surveys that we do internally, IT is one that sometimes get criticised mainly because of these extra measures, extra security measures, the level of courses, having to reset their password uh, frequently. So you know, our system automatically uh, basically prompts them to change their password. That is a one of the biggest bugbears bug bears of, of 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 staff and of individuals where you know they can't use the same password again, and it, it it's like these little things sometimes can can be annoying and frustrating. But you know we we've got to keep getting that message across the fact that it's very important to safeguard yourselves, the organisation, and that's the message we've got to we've got to relay time and time again. That's just from our personal sort of experience. Uh, and Chris, but, I mean, first of all, uh, briefly, if you could, because of time, uh, do you agree that there has to be a balance? And do you think there are ever any circumstances in which you can perhaps go a bit too far? Uh, and finally, Chris, you know, you've provided our listeners with so much information that I don't think in the, in the time we've spent with you, we've been able to, you know, talk about everything so i'd like to give you the opportunity to you know to tell people if they if they want to talk to you and your business and uh, and have a conversation uh, how do they get in touch with you how should they do that but first of all before we do that uh, can can we just go too far sometimes um, i think it depends on the risk i think i think business and it should never get in the way uh, of, of doing business so, so you know cyber security and it is an enabler and security is an enabler. Again, we're not an IT company, we're a cyber security company. So our kind of objective is making sure you do business securely and making sure there's minimum risk um, when you do that business. It's a bit like life. So the one thing I'd just like to touch upon is, you know, cyber security is no difficult, no different to physical security. So we can have a great conversation about this building, CCTV, guards, gates, locks. That's no different to cyber security. It's just different language. But in essence, how you protect a building and how you protect your infrastructure, it's exactly the same. And it's, you know, cost versus risk. Do you want to have a tank outside here? Do you want to have armed guard? Or do you think that's an over-exaggeration? Now, if we had the crown jewels here, maybe that tank's probably needed. If we don't, then do we? So again, just to try and bring all that together, I think that there's always a compromise and there's always an understanding against the risk. Um, in regards to further conversations, absolutely. I mean, cyberqgroup.com, so people can go there and have a look at the services and what we do. And then in regards to the email address, it's the team at cyberqgroup.com. So should people come uh, have any further questions, then if they email the team at cyberqgroup.com, then uh, we'll we'll come back to them and, and happy to continue the conversation. Yeah, so I'm sure, Saf, we can perhaps put that when we post um, the information. So be finally, Saf, um, we've learnt so much, haven't we? But are there any particular takeaways that you've taken that you that you go away with from our conversation? Or, or I mean, is there anything that that sticks in your mind as uh, uh, perhaps that you didn't realise that 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 we've learnt from from Chris? The, I mean, there's 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 so many things. I mean, I I, the, uh, I mean, just just a couple of things from from a personal perspective. I mean, the the Wi-Fi angle when you're going into a public space yeah. is something that you know I sort of you trying to ask for Wi-Fi. What's the Wi-Fi password? What's the Wi-Fi password? That's probably made me a little bit more conscious to say, actually, you know what? I've got enough data on my phone. Do I really need the Wi-Fi? Isn't it better for me to use probably yes, that's a local hub. And, and not getting the habit of probably 
looking at Wi-Fi. I mean, that's just, uh, you know, I'm not sure what the risk status of that is. But for consciously, I'm, thought, I'm thinking to myself, next time I'm, uh, I'm at, a, at a hotel or some other place, maybe don't rush to get <laughs> to, to start using their Wi-Fi. Just stick to your own uh, uh, data set. So that's something that I thought, you know, may, maybe I might start doing that. And, and, so, and, and we're already to a certain level being taught on a regular basis the fact that, you know, there's a lot of phishing attacks, there's, there's a lot of malware attacks, there's all of these things that you need to be cautious of. And from sometimes you need that reminder that, you know, what the things that we're going through, the fact that we, you know, we've got encryption on our emails, the fact that we've got uh, uh, some safeguards, you know, our, you know, one of the things, frustration sometimes for, for us is that so an email comes in from a legitimate source, but it goes into our junk folder or spam folder. And sometimes I'm thinking, you know, that's a bit too strong. You know, you guys are just, you know, putting everything in there. These are legitimate emails. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, you know what? It's not too bad a task for me to go in once in a while and check, just check junk and, and so forth. So I'm a bit more, I think, conscious, a bit more aware and, and, and possibly a little bit more encouraging in terms of the safeguards that we've got in place. So definitely lots of nuggets of uh, uh, learning there. I really appreciate, again, your support that you've given us, uh, Chris. Pleasure. Okay. I think we all wish that somebody would hack my stopwatch <laughs> and, uh, so that the, the, the time stopped because there's so much that we could we could talk about. Um, Chris, it's been fantastic to have you, hasn't it? Thank so, you. Absolutely. Been, no, thank you. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. Thank and, you. Um, and thank you very much for your time. We are curtailing this canny conversation with a cause. Um, we do hope that you've enjoyed what you've heard. If you've got any questions or any feedback, let us have it. Um, like us if you can, and um, subscribe because, you know, this has been a fascinating conversation. It's one of a series of hopefully fascinating conversations. Um, hopefully we'll be back soon. Until then, stay safe and stay cyber safe. Uh, and I'm sure that Chris could, one of the people that could help you with that. But until next time, take care. Bye-bye.